We yeah, we've gone down a thousand rabbit holes and in, into the mouths of several snakes. Hello, and welcome to the 82nd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday, the 4th of January, 2018, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. This week, we talked to show regular C. Derek Farron about the recently released 10-part documentary series, The Vietnam War, made by Ken Burns and Lynn Novak. It's a pretty amazing documentary series, about as balanced and accurate a program about a US-led war you could expect to find on a mainstream US network. Even more so considering it was made with money from the Koch brothers. The idea for this episode was to talk about the amazing ability of the Vietnamese people to purposely act under the guidance of their Marxist-Leninist leaders and what positives we can take from that type of organisational structure. However, we're quickly blown off course and end up talking about every revolution under the sun and the problems facing radical action in today's world. This week's show was brought to you by all the monthly subscribers and apologies for the poor audio quality of my voice. For some reason Skype decided to use the microphone on my webcam instead of my good quality podcasting microphone. Anyways, to the interview. What specifically do you want to talk about about this Vietnam thing? The North Vietnam have been trying to kick somebody out of occupying it pretty much its entire history. You know, like say Ireland has the same history, for example, but we didn't never went to the length or had to go to the length that they went to. And there's not too many countries in history because a lot of them have been had their boot on their neck and they didn't put up that type of a fight. There's probably not too many that put up fights like that, maybe Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, Greece. And North Korea, you know, like there's not that actual money. Maybe Japan, in World War Two. Well, the, the, well, here's the thing, though. You have to a- you have to ask yourself. I mean, like the the left communist critique of all this is is is, is that I, I don't know that I consider myself a left communist, but I do think they have a point here. That most of the most of those wars are national liberation wars, right? But the, 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 there's a strong nationalist undertone binding things together. Um, the Viet Cong were different. They really were engaging in like. Major, major stuff, rent reforms, land, you know, st- stuff like that. You mentioned a bunch of a, a bunch of scenarios about the, what they were, what groups were willing to fight, and how they fought, that conflated them together in, the, in a prior question. When you were talking about like the USSR, China, North Korea, and Vietnam, I actually, you know, I'm going to go against communist, both left and, and standard ML communist history, and say th- those revolutions don't marry each other at all. What I was trying to say, I wasn't meaning the revolution. I was talking, I was kind of talking more about, say, like Greece and Yugoslavia and ones that had a communist party that put up a, a fight and lost huge amounts of their population and never backed down. I suppose Russia is probably similar. Just, just the, you know, Japanese imperialism, they put up a fight against Americans before they backed down. But most of these ones seem to be a mixture of some type of Marxism and some type of nationalism. Arguably, the Bolsheviks being the, the clear counterexample, they were pretty ardently anti-nationalist. But, yeah, it, it's, it's, hard, it's really hard for me to say. Ho Chi Minh himself is, is an interesting figure in this, but he's not going to give you a clear answer to how much of it was nationalism, how much of it was socialism. You know, he, he uh, went on a sojourn into France and was, like so many, actually, Seems to have been exposed to communist ideas in France in the you know in the early ni- 20th century around 1911 1912. Then in 1912 he goes to New York and goes to Boston. He made a lot of connection with Korean nationalists and Korean nationalists at this time. Uh, it's important to remember were all over the place in the ideological st- spectrum. A lot of them would be what we would call now national anarchists. They were mixing Marxism. Uh, in anarchism, depending with ideologies of blood race that they were getting from Germany. And he, he met a lot of those people first in France and then really met them in the United States, uh, particularly in the Parker House Hotel. He worked for a wealthy family in Brooklyn, at least he says so. There's no evidence of this um, otherwise. And he worked for General Motor, uh, Motors as a line manager. He seems to have some connection to the U.S. State Department when he was there. Not quite clear on that either i can't find exactly where people have said what he did or did not get he was really he was really 
in touch with a lot of things there, but he wasn't in the United States for very long. He was only then he spent five years in the United Kingdom, and he seems to have been some kind of left nationalist. He he joined the French Socialist Party when he went back to France in 1919, and he stayed in France for for four more years, and then kind of was arguing for self determination and decolonization. So, you know, in the leader, you have very Western-influenced thinker who was radicalized in France. And in a way, actually, this this mirrors um, King Song Il, um, who also was radicalized in France similarly, and also the Cambodian Camille Rouge, who were radicalized in France. So there's a lot of radicalization in France going on. What that's built over, though, is a little harder to say. I mean, the common turn... The common turn relationship gets even more complicated because after 1923, um, Ho Chi Minh is explicitly tied to the common term. The common term politics were all over the place I mean, because they were encouraging pop front stuff at the time. The common turn officially backing Chiang Kai shek at one point, even when, you know, in 1927, he's leaving anti communist coup. You know, the, the politics of the common turn in Southeast Asia are crazy. Now, Backdrop to all this is you have a is you have a country that's never experienced capitalist development, which is the other trait that all the countries that you mentioned except for Yugoslavia shared, which is important. You know, I don't know how much you can learn when you're talking about developed capitalist nations. Every damn model that you have is from underdeveloped nations. Every single one. When you say ML, what do you mean? Marxist Leninist. So it's my nice word for Stalinist. Although, to be fair, Ho Chi Minh is actually probably, even though he was, they were definitely Stalinists and that they were allied to the Soviet Union and they took answers from the Comintern. Um, he's probably, he was probably actually the least hardline of, of those key figures in a lot of ways. And yet, the Viet Cong were also the most hardline independence movement. They were willing to do things that almost nobody else was except for the Cambodians, who were directly opposed to them. So it's, it's interesting, it's a wonder how much of the Marxism, the understanding of Marx, say, plays into the leaders like Ho Chi Minh, and how much of it is seeking a backer from a foreign superpower for their anti-imperialism. Yeah, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to say. And, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to compare Ho Chi Minh to Mao right now. Mao, for example... And I, I've gotten this from a, a Russian biography of him that's been translated that goes into the documents that they discovered in the Russian archives, as well as the official Mao, uh, Chinese sources. And Mao was a communist pretty early on, but as far as his actual knowledge of like Marxist doctrine, he didn't seem to have read Mar Marx directly at all until the 50s. In fact, he went, from what we know from his development, he was exposed to Kropotkin as a teenager because it was readily available that the Russian anarchists were actually readily available in Chinese first. Then he was exposed to sort of a Chinese liberal reading of Nietzsche, which is weird. Then he encountered the communist. He got into real communist politics first in the thirties. He started reading Stalin and Lenin. And from what I can tell from the documentary sources, he didn't read Marx at all till the 1950s. It wasn't particularly pertinent to him. And if you read like Mao's On Contradiction in, uh, in a lot of his you know, Little Red Book stuff, you'd be surprised how like Marx is barely mentioned in a lot of that. I mean, they mention like dialectical materialism and stuff, but you get the feeling that he got that from Stalin glosses, and he's glossing that, so it's a third time gloss removed. Ho Chi Minh's a little different. Marx didn't even use the term dialectical materialism. Right. Ho Chi Minh's a little different because he does seem to have been um, given a pretty good socialist education in France as a cadre member. And so he was not coming into the common turn with the same sort of baggage. And it's interesting because Vietnam sort of always distrusted the Maoist end of the spectrum. You know, it, it's another interesting thing about these countries is like, you know, Vietnam's war immediately after the war with us is an uh, intercommunist war. Right, they go to war with Cambodia. So Mao, Mao's instincts, uh, Mao's instincts were one thing. Ho Chi Minh's are another. Ho Chi Minh seemed very much a kind of, in some ways, he was sort of aligned with someone you'd think of like Ding or somebody later who's kind of into that uh, second international common turn developmentalism. 
Well, so they really thought they had to, like, develop the country on a kind of bourgeois lines in accelerated fashion, which is what happened, you know, what stopped Russia, basically. And what Ding arguably did to China uh, uh, based off of, you know, and they didn't put, you know, they weren't just pulled out of their butt. It was like they were basing it off of the NEP and then and some other things and then um, the, the rapid industrialization. Did they do a, a rapid industrialization on the back of the peasants like was done under NEP in, in Russia? Not in the same way, no. They were actually, from what I, and again, Vietnam is the, the area that I am, pro, like, of the communist countries, the one I'm the least comfortable with in, in Asia. But it doesn't seem like they did it as dramatically. And they also weren't, they were more into land reform than anything else. <laughs> that was the biggest thing they were doing. So they were doing land reform, and they did try to, collectivize the farms and factories but when they when they ha- started having massive inflation they slowed down and it's hard the, the other thing is the, the the vietnamese economy until 1985 was basically war was a war economy they were at war the entire time like because as soon as is the americans get out they have to deal with the cambodian issue and like i said that was her socialist inter-war and the Khmer Rouge was trying to expand their form of socialism into North Vietnam. Immediately, they have to start going into war. So they don't really, they don't really, you know, start a peacetime economic program till the eighties. And by that point, it was communism, but it would already kind of gone. It was already kind of influenced by the the Ding reforms and by Glasnost and all that. It's like with China. When I when you you want to talk about like the most successful revolution in history, you always talk. Everyone always talks about China, right? Because it's it's a clear win. But what's interesting about it is it's all military win. Like the left communist, um, like Bordiga, were very skeptical of it because they're like the development was very sporadic, and what a lot of the the left end of Euro communism said about China, it, particularly after it, after it split as a separate model from the USSR was that they were basically just doing bourgeoisification. And by that, they kind of meant that they were developing something like state capitalism, although they didn't use that word, and I'm I'm hesitant to use that word, too, because I increasingly don't know what it means. But that they were trying to do the developmental, the developmental industrialization of bourgeois by, uh, you know, bourgeois development by force and really fast. And it works at first, and then you have a rapid slowdown, which has happened in all of these economies except Vietnam. Vietnam, you didn't see it because Vietnam never really went through that. They were in a war economy for so long that when they finally transitioned to something else, they transitioned directly to sort of a kind of reform communism a la Ding. Although they wouldn't have called it that either. But they they went, they instead, you know, after they did all the land reforms and nationalized, basically nationalized land, they they basically did a market socialist economy. Like 70s USSR and, and posting China. How do we prize apart the, you know, it's a difficult question, I don't expect you to have an answer. How, how do we analyze the component of just pure anti-imperialist nationalism in their incredible fight against, say, the French and the American imperial powers? And, uh, you know, how much of it is just purely that? And how much of it is, is a kind of a revolutionary class action? Uh, it's really hard to say. I mean, it, it's hard to say, one, because the class action is of what? Who, what classes would have existed in Vietnam? It's the same problem you have in China. The, 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 the uh, proletariat would have been tiny. I'm not saying it wouldn't have been existed, but it was, it was not a hyperdelic capitalist country. So it was mostly a peasant army. Well, this is the big flaw with scientific socialism, isn't it? It predicted you know, the proletariat as the revolutionary class. And in a large amount of cases, it was the peasantry. And the, the peasantry could have been, and were sometimes, just as revolutionary in feudalism. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, but the old Marxist critique is all they did was change class relations, right? Like, they would, when the peasants would get some reforms, they would become, you know, like a yeoman class in some cases or something like that. It didn't abolish class relations. Well, you can say that was true in, the, in these cases, too, but this becomes a major th- – this is like the – this is the thing I lose sleep over because 
it is one of those things where right wingers will attack us and say, well, the you know the the proletariat's never actually risen up. Well, it's not true that they haven't risen up, but they've only ever been successful as the leaders of a mon- uh, in the minority. They're like the minority leadership of uh, aligned with honestly petty bourgeois and bureaucratic elements in an army led you know where the fighters are mostly really tough ass peasants. Like, but in in a way that makes sense too, right? Because you know, Kowski, and I'm going to bring up some, some Wellston Marcy history that's relevant here. Kowski would always say, for example, he would critique the general strike strategy of socialism. If we just had a general strike, we'd have socialism. Because they always say, well, the bourgeois can, can outlast you in a general strike. Because even if you stop production, they have already hoarded the a lot of the surplus value, i.e. they have food and you don't. <laughs> and, and guns. Yeah, and, and guns. And if you... If you can out if you can outlast that starvation period, you had enough political power to have an army to overthrow them anyway. <laughs> but in all the cases where you had real successful things, and particularly uh, Russia is different, but it, particularly in East Asia, the, part of the reason why the army didn't starve is that even if they lost the means of production, the peasants still could provide food. <laughs> You know, like, there's still a raw food level answer being met here. And they're also not fighting forces that have that have internal industrial strength. So they, they have external industrial strength. So they, they do have massive industrial power. I mean, you're talking about France and the United States, you know. But they're not, it's not there. And this is another thing where, like, I pull from non-Marxist theories. Like, I actually pull from some kind of right-wing theories on fifth-generation warfare. Insurgencies, like communist insurgencies in East Asia... All they have to do is survive, right? They all they have to serv- they have to survive long enough for, for the other side to lose will. And the the Vietnamese did way more than that. I mean, they they actively you know push things into actually let's be honest, three imperialist powers because we keep on forgetting that what hardened the Vietnamese was fighting the Chinese before the French even took over. Dynastic Vietnam was constantly being claimed as a vassal state by China. And they had almost, from what I can tell, like uh, like at least 500 years, but arguably uh, like a thousand defeating Chinese invaders. So this is like a cultural legacy that they had fighting off foreign imperialism going back way before the West even knew that this stuff was happening. And it was also, and this is important to think about for some of Vietnam's interesting later developments, they never trusted Chinese communism. And it was partly lingering from the fact that they had experienced Chinese imperialism, you know, priorly and didn't trust the Han to not try it again under communist form. And so this is where, like, when you ask me, how do we separate this out? Well, you still have inter-ethnic, you know, issues playing into the communist politics in, in Southeast Asia and East Asia the entire time. I mean, similarly um, with, with North Korea, a lot of the weirdness in Jusei comes from the fact that after Stalin died, North Korea didn't want to turn to China, so they tried to invent a parallel uh, a, a parallel mythology to Ma- Mao's cult of personality in Kim Il-sung. And that actually led to a lot of the particularities of Jusei ideology. So all this stuff had to do with pre-communist ethnic conflict. So yeah, it's very hard for me to parse out. I don't want to say that there's none of it, though, because, man, the, like, the thing about the, thing about the peasants, they really hated the rentier class. Like, so they, it wasn't just that they hated the foreigners. They really hated the rentier class. It was, in that sense, they were, it was very similar to the Mexican Revolution. Like, that was a lot of what was inspiring it. All these people with massive, you know, plantations and basically quasi-serfs. I mean, they hated those guys. Hated them, hated them, hated them. In, in Ireland, we had the, like probably one of the main reasons why it wasn't more socialist that the rentier class were all essentially British. So it just took on a hate the English texture instead of you know hate the system texture. Right. There are other dynamics that are hard for me to parse in in, in the Vietnam issue. I mean, one is the role of of religious conflict because you had the Catholic Buddhist tensions. You know, even even the Buddhist peace activists later on, as some of them, including the ones that have become famous in America, like uh, Thay Han, for example, they refused to condemn the the Marxist Leninists. Partially, the Marxist Leninists were defending Buddhists against um, Catholic encroachment on their culture. 
it gets very muddy. And the opposite's actually true in, for example, Korea, where the, the Buddhists were seen as being aligned with an imperial power, i.e. the Japanese. Getting back to this idea of what is the history of successful radical left revolution, what percentage of any of these societies that had the, some type of a communist slash anarchist revolution, what percentage of the population, what's the high water for active revolutionary class? Is it somewhere like Spain? Probably. I mean, it's it's actually hard to say. I mean, maybe Vietnam. If you separate out, if you if you separate out North Vietnam from South Vietnam, I mean, there's still there's still stuff about it that I am unclear on. For example, like there are minorities that sided with the South, like the Hmong, for example. That why they did it, I'm I don't know enough. Like what they were afraid of, were they associated with the rentier class? Were there other reasons? Were there was there some sort of ethnic conflict that that I just don't know enough about? So I'd love someone who's really up on their Vietnamese history to, to correct us. But well, What about elsewhere? Like, say, for example, somewhere like Greece or something, who stood up to Nazi Germany. Like, they, that was a solidly communist revolution, and it was quite revolutionary during the war, you know, and how, it was, how people lived their lives. Like, what is the high water? Because if we get to this idea of, like, ever having a... a... I, think it's probably, I, I think it's probably Spain. Honestly. But again, like, Spain achieved that for the fact that it was a very poorly unified in some ways, but it was a unified front. It was a united front. They didn't have the other as well. They didn't have, like, an imperial power in Spain. Right, no. Well, I mean, when you look at the, the successful, the two, the two successful countries that don't have an anti-imperialist element, I mean, Lenin, Lenin and Russia kind of does, but, but where they are fighting and the enemy is almost purely internal, that's, that's Spain and Russia and Germany. And Spain and Germany don't go well. But even in this, even in the Spanish Revolution, what, per, what percentage was the Republican government? What percentage of them were CNT or anarchists or Marxists? Oh, God. That high? I don't know. Probably 15% at most. And in the Bolsheviks, that's true, too. I mean, because you have to remember, like, how the Bolsheviks came to power, even even the second time. The, the, the largest party... So. So, for example, when Lenin disbanded the constituent assemblies, um, what he was afraid of partly was whites, but partly was the fact that the Bolsheviks would have to admit that the social revolutionaries, the SR, were a larger party than them. And that they were going to have to enter into some kind of governmental alliance with another socialist group. So, you know, and I know that's controversial to say, but I think it's I think if you read in between the lines, it's pretty much a fact. So, like, even in a case where the, the majority population supported some sort of socialist program, like they were split. Were they split along those the traditional social democracy versus revolutionary communist lines? No, I mean, the social revolutionaries were revolutionaries, and they had three camps within them. It's funny because when you read Marxist, when Marx, and particularly even Trotskyists and stuff, they like to talk about this. They like to talk about the Mensheviks. Well, the reason why I think they picked the Mensheviks is the Mensheviks, the Mensheviks turn traitors and support the whites during the Civil War. The SRs largely don't. They eventually just kind of merge into the, the, the larger mass of the Bolsheviks, but they, they were probably the large party. From what I, And again, this is from what I can tell from reading archives and historical work. You know, I, it's almost impossible to know. So even when you had major support of a, of a revolutionary cadre, and again, like we say this, if, if you look at the class composition of the cadres, it's hard to say what they were either. The society that had, where the Socialist Party had the most working class, clearly working class membership, the SPD, was Germany. And that's where the revolutions went the least well, <laughs> you know, arguably. Because the SPD split, the right wing of the SPD helped the Freikorps suppress the, the communist wing. The communists had the mass of their support, from what I've read, and again, it's hard to know, and this is in Germany, um, were former workers they were largely the unemployed which is understandable given the post-war Versailles deal and all that malarkey the high unemployment at the time yeah i mean it, it, it makes sense it also seems you know that the right wing of the spd was already you know even as early as this is 1915 and not just on the subject of the war kind of betraying some parts of the working class so particularly the part of the working class that wasn't already employed or that had lost its job and during the malaise. So, like, it, it makes sense, and yet it makes getting hard numbers in any of this break down. And again, you know, uh, when I pull from sources, the, the sources do not agree on shit on these things, like, at all. They, they really don't. And even left-wing sources don't agree. 
So it's not like, you know, so I pull, let me look at the books, and I'm pulling from when I talk about the Bolsheviks, for example. I'm pulling from Fitzgerald, and I'm pulling from um, Kotkin, and Kotkin's kind of right, right we need, but Fitzgerald's not. I'm pulling from, uh, um, trying to get my comic books out here so I can see where I'm getting my stats from. Derek, I'm, I'm very surprised that your comic books aren't on your coffee table permanently. I have too many of them. Um, but Cohen, you know what I can what I can tell you is the autonomous uh, the the autonomy and the the purely proletarian revolution that so far has not happened. It kind of happened in Germany and was suppressed. And that was and honestly it's because the proletariat itself was highly divided. Well, that's it. And the the the, part, the Spartacus element of the German Revolution of of the SPD that was only a, a small left ultra left part of the party. Oh yeah, it was. It, it, uh, let's say the SPD had uh, probably twenty or thirty percent. You know, they were the, they were the single largest party at the time of all, and not just of socialist parties. Period. But the radical end of it, I mean, because it wasn't just Marxists. I mean, the SPD still had less. Italians and all that kind of stuff in it, even in 1914, 1915. Oh, I don't know, maybe maybe half of that, so 15 percent. And then like the 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 Spartacus Bund and the the com- the communist wing of it, maybe five percent, maybe maybe. And I was just, I was uh, for another podcast I was reading about why um, even Ingalls and had assumed that maybe this could all be done by democratic ballot, if get, that the revolution could be, you might have to, you would probably have to take up minor arms to force a democratic vote, but that the proletariat would just vote socialist then. Because the proletariat in these societies, particularly in Germany, France, England, you know, the developed socialist, I said socialist, haha, the developed capitalist societies, the proletariat was the largest group, by far the largest class. Actually, today, that's still true, but it didn't work. It didn't happen. You know, the, the, the proletariat was never unified in its voting patterns. And the 20th century, in so much that there's still a labor movement, I don't want to. I don't want to call it dead. I, 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 I think that's an overclaim that I tend to make when I'm feeling particularly pessimistic or trying to shock people. But let's be honest. Even in the case of Britain, where Corbynism is, I think a, a sincerely working class movement. When I looked at the stats. The voting patterns of the UK aligned to class less than any other time in its history. <laughs> I was like, wow. You know, um, whether or not you were urban or rural was a lar- bigger predictor of how you voted in this last election than whether or not you were and your age, which does have class alignment to some degree, um, than whether or not you were class or not. And that was that was fascinating to me because that that now mirrors America. Now, it isn't that, for example, that there's a narrative in America that like, like the working class is like the peasant class and it's super reactionary, right? That's been that was a new communist thing. I don't think that's true at all. What uh, the evidence I have is the working class just doesn't engage in political anything. <laughs> like they don't vote. Um, yeah, the working class nowadays in England, say for example, where I am now, are, are probably one of the most heavily propagandized class of people that's ever existed. Oh okay, yeah. For sure. The media now is just pure propaganda for working class. They're owned by Murdoch and billionaires, and they're fed stuff. You know, like compared to what the working class were reading and doing 100, 150 years ago, the working class, as a rule, does not do intellectual reading like they used to. No. You know that book? It's a famous book on the reading habits of the working class in like 100 years ago in Britain. It doesn't surprise me. You know, I'm reading a book at the moment by a previous guest, an Irish Marxist called Helena Sheehan, and she wrote a book on Marxist philosophy and the history of it. I was reading that, and it was saying, like, at one point, there's this quasi-post-Marxist philosopher from around the turn of the century called, I think, Dietzkin. Have you heard of him? Yeah, I have, yeah. And uh, she was, like, quoting some famous philosopher who was working with the miners and the Welsh miners who was teaching them philosophy, and they were going, oh, that's Dietzkin, isn't it? You know, like the, that the actual rural, very poor Welsh miners were reading like high philosophy back then. And nowadays, you know, God knows what they're doing. Well, yeah, I, I bring up the I'm going to sound like a libertarian, uh, an American libertarian uh, for a second. But uh, Marx did say that we should never trust the state with education. <laughs> 
Um, and sometimes, you know, and I, I'm a I'm a teacher, so you know. Damn straight, Derek. You're a teacher. You know, more people read now. I mean, have basic literacy skills in the United States than probably ever in the history of the United States, and yet reading ability is super low. And working class people, particularly rural working class people or exurban working class people, working class people not in major cities. Oh my God, they can barely read. And I know for a fact that my my grandfather, who was was a brick maker, and he only had a fourth grade education. I'm not saying he was a prodigious reader of books, but he was conversant and had read books that would be very hard for someone with a high school education now to get through. That's with a fourth grade education. A lot of it is that we've invested the intellectual capital in other things. But I I have sort of – I've been wondering about this this idea – of political consciousness. Uh, I have some friends who have taken the the idea that there is no proletariat now because there's no politicized proletariat. I think that's sort of like, that's misreading how class works. But I do kind of see their point because if you look at, if you think of proletariat as wage earner, right? More of the population now is technically in the proletariat than has ever been the case in human history. And yet a proletarian class, or even like, you know, and it's I say this because a lot of people that who are in the proletariat by that definition would not even think themselves as being working class. Is that a percentage or just a, a growth number? It's a percentage number. Like, like more people are wage earners now in both percentage and gross than have ever existed in human history. It's it's huge. Like even like when you think about like most of the t- you know the ninety nine percent. Well, a good portion of the one percent are still technically wage earners. They're in this weird hybrid category where they're wage earners and also stockholders. But then again, that's true for like I don't know half of the population in the in the United States because we're forced to be. We're not capitalists though. We're just invested in the system. Like yeah, well you know it's irrelevant to most people whether they get their pension from a four hundred one k or whether that money is coming from a state pension. Like it doesn't really matter to them in any sense. No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter to me either. But it, it is interesting. And you know, I used to hear Marx say, "Well, invest more people in the capitalist system." I'm like, but does it? I mean, like everybody's invested in the capitalist system in the sense that economy is bad. We don't eat, uh, or we lose our homes. It seems to me, though, that Derek, you know, this idea of the proletarian as a revolutionary class that Engels and Marx had, you know, what a Hayekian would point out or something is that there's like division of labor problem. Oh yeah. Is that like not everybody can read three books of Marx, collected works of Engels, uh, and read some anarchism and read critiques of all these other stuff and the the news of the day and do all of that. They're just the actual overloads to do that stuff when people don't get taught it in school as dogma is just it's overwhelming for most. And you know, that's a huge massive investment overhead, if you want to put it in capitalist terms, for any kind of radical party to undertake. And it's just a systemic reality that's always going to work against some kind of revolution that will actually have 51% of the people to follow it through. Well, so, so let me get... Right now, there's been a lot of frustration over political models in the United States, and there's been a huge influx in the people into things like the DSA, but there's been a counter-movement, too, who, a movement... Um, largely inspired by by former Maoists, but some people who are inspired by even me, because what I would talk about with dual power, who have talked about you know the serve to people ideology, parallel school systems, so mutual aid networks and stuff like that as a way to build cadres. And I'm like, that's fine, and that's good, but I want you to to really think about how that scales because you're going to run out of money. <laughs> like you you are not going to have enough. You're going to be in a catch-22 situation. Like You wouldn't need money if you have enough free labor to do it. But you're pulling from working-class people. Working-class people, by definition, work. They need you to do labor for them and to maybe help educate their kids and you know babysit and all that. And I'm not, I'm not bemoaning these groups trying to do this. Um, but to do that at scale, you're going to need money. Or stipend. Yeah. You know, you could have like a church does. How many churches take 10% of people's earnings? You know, that's kind of common in African churches. Oh, well, I mean, like, uh, the, the Mormon church forces it, which is why it's one of the richest organizations in the United States. You know, honestly, I think uh, a party should be supported from... You're pulling 10% for, for poor people. You've got to give at least that much back for it to be worth them doing. I, I was talking to someone about joining the IWW, and, you know, at my, at my income, it would cost me, I don't know, $30 a month and a ton of time. 
Okay. And part of me wants to do it, although there's only at most six some worldwide members of the IWW but have had had some recent successes in actually unionizing things though. Um that they haven't had in I don't know a hundred years. Um <laughs> But it's it, they've still been small scale. They've been small city where I'd shop things, and they haven't been totally successful. But they've actually done some things, and I don't want to belittle them. But here's the thing. You're going to ask a, per, a, a working class person to pay between 10 and $15 a month to you. All right? That's not that much, right? You don't think. And yet, on the margins, that's like maybe one meal for their kids. The, the, the capitalist union that they're already a member of, the, and I, I'm going to say that – like if they're in the AFL-CAO, it's not that these, these unions don't do anything for them, but the reason why they're so unpopular is that they very much seem like a lobbying wing of the Democratic Party because literally most of the money given to them go directly to the Democrats, like for sure. And how is their leadership paid? So how is the leadership of the ACL-CAO paid? They're paid by stock investment. <laughs> so like they get paid pretty well, but they get paid more like management than capitalist in America. Don't, but it's still how they're paid, though. They're not even paid from the damn union membership fees. <laughs> like they're paid from, from, from like, a, you know, the, the union stock holdings. And the union has stock holdings. But not the, not the IWW. IWW is purely supported by membership. But here's my point. The AFL-CIO, at least, if, even if it in states, for example, like in my state in Utah, if I join a teacher's union, we can't strike. We can't do collective bargaining, right? So, but at least what I get from it is that I'll at least get liability insurance. What do I get from a left-wing organization? I get a demand on my time. To be frank, is not likely to pay off. So for most people, this is not a, a wise investment of their money or their time because they know in the long term the, the, the likelihood of success is low. And they're not offering anything else in the interim. The, the old social classes, the old parties did other things. They, they did do these mutual aid things. They also, like, had mutual insurance. They opened, bank, they opened their own bank cooperatives and all of that. But what happened in the case of, like, say, Sweden where it happened, it became substituted to the state apparatus. Um, well, of Germany, where they have all the membership and all that, the organization becomes an endpoint and not the revolution. At a certain point, it's, it becomes about childcare and not 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 uh, the apple cart. Yeah. So, so what I what I what I worry about is a lot of these new people who are trying to redo this old model again in the United States, and, and they have had some mo- some moderate success. They're still when I say moderate success, we're still talking about cadres of maybe five or six hundred at most. That's what the Black Panthers did in the nineteen sixties. Right. And as I like to point out, the the Black Panthers were the most successful revolutionary organization, the closest thing to a mass revolutionary organization that existed in the U.S. since the 1914 to 1919 era SPA, all right? It was still smaller than the DSA, even adjusting for population, and it was still easy to get rid of. You didn't have to kill that many people to collapse the organization, and that's the reality. And that, and I say that as a person who admires m- most of the members of the of the Black Panther Party. I, I, there are some of them who I who I don't. I think Cleaver can rot in hell. I, I mean, I don't believe in hell, but if if I did, Cleaver, I'm looking out for you. But like you know, like Newton and um, and Hampton, in, in some ways, I feel very differently about and feel very positively about. But at the at the same token, it wasn't hard to collapse that organization. And there was there, there was a whole bunch of ways that, that there was a whole bunch of mistakes. That, that opened them up to the kind of infiltration they got, too. And uh, this is not to blame them, but you're trying to run, like, drug interference programs with people. You're going to have narc agents. You're just going to. And that was the opening that was really able to be used to get to Hampton, for example, how they were able to more or less just murder him, is narc informants. And then the, uh, they're gun runners, for fuck's sake. You know, they, they were getting these guns. And their gun runner, Aoki, who was famous in the Bay Area till he died, and it came out after he died, he was a fucking informant. I mean, like, the, they were set up. Like, the, gu- the gun element of it was actually deliberately set up and encouraged by, the, by COINTELPRO. And I was like, oh, my God. And that's the best we've done in the United States. I, there are more successful parties elsewhere, but... You know, and, and I don't want to besmirch the name of the of the Black Panthers, but it makes me it does make me like wonder how all this works. Because my, my other thing for you is the exact same thing. What I see if it doesn't go to Black Panther route and you don't and you don't get basically put down, you bec- you basically turn into an NGO. All right, and, and that's what I'm worried about with these current things. So if they don't get you get you get turned into uh, an NGO, or you become a weird like cult. <laughs> Those so far seem to be the three options. 
sorry, it's funny you should mention NGO because a friend of mine was a Chomsky reader and that, and he ended up getting involved in NGOs. And then he ended up in Vietnam with the UN, and he was talking about how the government works there. You know how there's different tendencies, all that, and they all lobby their own central committee for stuff. I don't, I, I think that's how it works. I'm not sure. He was surprised. He said the model worked as well as, say, Ireland or England or our democracy. So, yeah. You know, he was like, he was shocked when he saw like a system that we would outwardly think is rubbish is probably just as good as the rubbish we have here. Well, yeah. Well, here's the thing about the political tendencies. In the in USSR, those were suppressed. In China, those were suppressed. Both in at the outcome of the uh, the Thousand Flowers campaign, and then again, and then the anti rightist movements that happened. And rightist uh, rightist in China just means we don't like you because there's a lot of left wing groups who got caught up into that. But also, again, you know, in the Cultural Revolution, is that these these tendencies were played off each other and encouraged basically to kill each other in street fights. And and Vietnam that didn't happen, so they actually do have a multi tendency party. So, so the function that, you know, like official parties play in Ireland or even in the United States become kind of like caucuses within the party in, in Vietnam. To be fair to Vietnam, Lenin actually, in his early Lenin, you know, the more liberal Lenin, the, 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 the pre-Civil War Lenin, the Lenin that Trotsky is all like the crow on about how awesome he is. But he saw that, too. He, he didn't really want to suppress all the different opinions. He wanted them to be expressed, but within a party organization. And Bordiga argues the same thing. I, I've, I have problems with Bordiga the more I study him, but as stuff is available that I can read and, you know, with friends helping me parse out the Italian or by reading in English as it gets translated, but that he also thought like multi-tendency parties were mandatory because it was the closest thing to something like a bourgeois sorting mechanism that would could be maintained. So it's not actually, you know, a lot of those one-party states, one, a lot of those multi-party states are really one-party states anyway. And two, a lot of one-party states are not as one-party as you think because internally they're actually fairly diverse. That is definitely true in Vietnam. But I think to a lesser degree in China that's true now. Yeah, apparently there's a lot of tendencies. You know, there's the Marxist side and the capitalist side in, in China similarly. You know, and they have their battles. Yeah, there are a group of weird kind of Stalinists who are really pro the current Chinese government because uh, Xi Jinping is not totally a capitalist in the way the prior premiers were. but. But at the same time, he's also not really down with the Maoist wing of the party either. I've also been increasingly unwilling to call China a capitalist or a socialist country because it doesn't. It has, it it really does have elements of both. Um, there's still a whole lot of state ownership of land and mineral resources, for example. I think the economy is still something like sixty percent state owned. So it seems to be like you know, it, it seems to be like a state kind of social capital mix. Yeah, I mean, it's but it's also hard for me to call it socialist. Half of the world's billionaires are there. So it's, you know, private billionaires, not just a state. So it, it's, it's very hard for it's it, To me, it's hard to break it down exactly what it is at this point. I'll tell you what it is, Eric. It's 1950s British economy. <laughs> yeah, which wasn't really either thing either, right? Like, <laughs> Well, it certainly was still a capitalist, but it, it, it had a lot of state control. In development. Right. I, I just find it interesting because to me the, the, the interesting as a as a Marxist in the twenty first century, what I'm in in now these days is is um getting the research questions right. So like what are we even asking? Like how do we define our terms? What are what are our goals really? You know? And what are our categories really? And then the other question is, why does nothing look like the way we predicted it? And and I mean this in a, in a because it's also not true that everything is cleanly capitalist in the way we would predict either. I really do think we have to be honest about how we've gotten these predictions fundamentally wrong. Douglas Lane and I on a podcast that is probably not available to the public where Doug says he thinks the division of labor may be eternally with us. And <laughs> I don't know if he kept it in. I haven't heard. Um, but I'm outing him. And we also talked about um, all the questions in politics that Marxism doesn't and can't answer. And we shouldn't pretend that it does. I mean, I think there's huge swaths of geopolitical stuff that Mar Marxism will not give you a clear answer to. Anything in the Middle East, most things involving race, um, but anything in the Middle East, man, um, there's no answer for Marx. Because you're not looking at capitalist versus non-capitalist powers. Is it not just typical inter-capitalist imperial rivalry? But even then, you're also dealing with sectarianisms and ethnic conflict that predate our current class divisions that are playing into it. And the capitalists are playing it off each other, right? But, but like, if I want to pick Russia versus the United States, I'm, li I'm literally picking whatever capitalist power I like more. I'm not, like, there's no clear Marxist answer to that. No, it's the, it's the least harm principle, isn't it? But, like, I think that 
all of those things that people think, like it's Shia and Sunni and all that. I think that's a lot of bullshit. Behind it is just pure power, and that's just exploitation of those things. Like It's like people looking at Northern Ireland and saying the problem was transubstantiation or consubstantiation. It's got nothing to do with the differences in belief. It's got nothing to do with having false idols of saints. Israel is, can be easily explained by colonialism. Israel can be explained the same way as, as America can be explained or New Zealand can be explained. It, it can't accept that the... Ex- um, why did why Stalin support its creation? Who knows? Maybe he wanted to get rid of some Jews. But I actually think he, he supported it under the idea that, that any national group have a nation. But there's probably a lot to be said for that idea. It's also clearly a subtle colonial project. Like, I'm actually not disagreeing with you in that. I'm just saying that, like, that's a question where it seems like we should have a clear answer. But there's two different, there's two different, and neither, actually, both theories don't have much to do with Marx, to be completely honest. But there's two theories, two different theories from Lenin, right? One, and this is how Stalin justified it, that if you accepted Jews as a legitimate ethnic group, they should have their own nation. And since there was a large population of Jews in Palestine even before the mandate, conversely, it looks like it is settler colonialism. And it was. I mean, there was an invitation of a massive amount of Jews to move into an area that was not really theirs. And then you have the whole issue of, well, how do ethnic groups have the rights to nations and land under Marxism? And they kind of don't. My only point in that is, depending on what part of Marxist theory, or, or, let's be serious, Marxist-Leninist theory you want to focus on is how you can justify it. And that is why formal Marxist-Leninist parties have been all over the map historically on Israel. Stalin initially opposed it. Then when Russian autonomous reason didn't work, he supported it. And then when alliances shifted, particularly what seemingly mostly over religion in, in the 60s in the United States, you started using Israel as real politics, they went back to opposing it. And the parties had gone equally all over the map on it. Um, right now, it seems like things are pretty clear because it's pretty clear what Israel is doing. But historically, it was all over the place. And I just point that out because a lot of things where we say, oh, there is clearly a Marxist answer to this. Well, then why the hell have Marxists been on, on every side of the question and have, and, have, and have chapter and verse citations, usually of either Engels or Lenin, to back up their position? And it is because it is not actually all that clear, depending on what element of the conflict you were focusing on. You know, um, uh, should the Kurds have a right to their own nation in Syria? Well, according to most MLs now, no, that we should be supporting the, uh, you know, Assad. That is because I think most Marxist-Leninists, for some reason, see Russia's interests more in theirs than the United States. But that you could easily answer that in three or four different ways with, with, with Lenin's writings on nation and with Stalin's writings on nation. You can go either way at it. Well, it just shows you that it's been these type of statecraft politics has been used by Marxists just like imperial powers use them. Oh, yeah. Like the Bible, it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than for a camel to pass to die the needle. And then they also have all the other stuff about the parable of the talent. You know, you can just pick and choose whatever you want from most things, you know? Right. I mean, you know, it, it, and MLs are, you know, usually the strongest of an anti-imperialist. But I, asked, I like to answer, ask them about the both the Russification and Hanification policies in the 60s, which is, you know, you took the dominant majority culture and tried to enforce it on people. And I, and I say that and I point that out because I'm like, but, you know, you guys talk about national autonomy and all this, but this is a real thing. It's a real thing in two different countries, and some fairly conservative kind of black nationalist writers, well, I wouldn't call them exactly black nationalist writers, but like thinker like Ralph Ellison pointed that out on why black people shouldn't trust communists, even though he admitted that you know the, the Soviet Union was way better on race relations than the United States, that they didn't think it was in good faith, and that they had evidence for it not being. And, you know, I, I only bring this up because I just want to go back to the original question on Vietnam. You know, we've gotten way off of it now. But um, yeah, I'm becoming, you know, it's funny because I'm known as the anti, anti-SJW anti Marxist in some ways. I think somewhat unfairly because people don't exactly understand what I'm saying. And I do think in many ways class debates need to come first. But I completely get a lot of the racial identitarian distrust of, of, of class first ideology because how it's been used in the past. <laughs> That you know the new the new communist movement didn't come out of nowhere, even though you know Malcolm X, for example, uh, said some really nice things about socialist in their in their stance on race relations. You know, but even he also pointed out that you could you still probably couldn't trust them, and that if Russia was a model, then you had issues. And they didn't know much about the Russification policies. That wasn't widely known about until the nineties. It's interesting, isn't it? Like 
quite a, a lot of what we've been talking about is how revolutionary can proletariat ever be. I always remember when I was about 17 or 18, we used to go to this enormous nightclub in a place called Carrickton Cross, County Monaghan, really in the middle of nowhere in Ireland now, right in the, in the sticks. And it was like, used to be 2,000 people in this massive place, right in the middle of nowhere. And the level of fight going on in these nightclubs was just chronic, you know, lots of like Irish guys, drunk, you know, young guys. And they had, I don't know how many bouncers they had in this place, but they probably had like 30 or 40 to 2,000 people. But yeah, if a fight broke out, they could get all these bouncers, they would come and they would run in like a military formation and just get guys and just drag them and throw them out of the place. And I was like, now when I think back about that nightclub, I always like kind of think that's kind of what the Leninists were <laughs> on some level. Highly organized, small groups, they can really take control. Is that, is that the limit of revolutionary behavior though? You know, that's what I struggle with. Is that model the limit? I think you have to ask yourself, if we consider either the Industrial Revolution or the transition into capitalism truly revolutionary in themselves, the answer is hell no. Why? Because those revolutions didn't come about from a revolutionary party like seizing power. They just simply didn't. No, no, I agree. But, well, to a certain extent, they did seize power uh, in parliamentaries and stuff like that. But it, it, in, in certain sense, they were still a highly organized rich man's minority. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah that, that's, that's true objectively that's you know and to be fair that's been true for i guess is your point it's been true for us too right because um what socialist party has been worker based before a uh, revolution and i can't think of one like truly worker based i mean marx and marx and lenin weren't workers marx was descendant of a bureaucrat and Engels was out now bourgeois and marx obviously came from a bureaucratic class that doesn't really fit into our schema his his background before him was petty bourgeois. Mao was um, from a large land holding peasant, a poor but had a whole lot of land peasant family, and he was declassé himself. The same is somewhat true of Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh less so, but I actually don't know exactly his class background. But I think he was from fairly well peasant family. Fuck, I can't. I really can't think of a working class like any of our leadership that's ever been working class. How about James Connolly? James Connolly and Eugene Debs. But, uh, but, but, you know, but those are from the places where they were unsuccessful. <laughs> uh, Eugene Debs was truly working class. I mean, he, he came up and tried to, he worked with the IWW first, and he'd, he tried to break up what were craft and trade unions into industrial unions, because he, he, he thought that the, the, the elder union models actually worked like medieval guilds and that were kind of reactionary. Did a lot of real successful work in the in the labor. I mean, incredibly successful work in the labor movement, actually. But even even look at the labor party type ones. Most of their leaders are from the middle class. They're, they're actually rarely from the working class. Yeah, yeah, I know. It, it's something I lose sleep over <laughs> because it, it is hard to talk about the consciousness of the proletariat being what's going to lead the way when you don't have a single example of it. I have a question for you, Derek. Did these revolutions happen too early? As in, it's not like the proletariat had a long period of revolutionary development, say from when Marx's analysis came in. It had 50 years of development. Could it have taken 200 years of development? Is that a better model? Who signed up to that model? Uh, well, here's the thing. Marx clearly thought that it would be soon, at least in Europe. But I, I actually think that the, that the most optimistic we can be is somewhat developmentalist, because I actually like to point out trouble dating when it started because it could have started anywhere between like 1450 to 1700 technically you haven't completely gotten rid of all the elements of feudalism in england now <laughs> feudalism still exists if you buy a house in london most people they don't buy a house they buy a 900 year lease and every year they pay some money to the fucking shoot to westminster a feudal lord is the richest man in england not many people know that you know, true hardcore feudalism still existed in Sicily up until like the beginning of the 20th century. I, I, I in a way, I, I, I don't want to sound like a, a, a pie in the sky, like developmentalist, you know, it's all in the future. But I, I do think maybe it was too early. And the other thing is that we were our, our most successful revolutions. If you take like the Trotsky stage theory revolution, where you have to have a bourgeois one and then you own the, the bourgeois revolution of, of Russia and China were almost simultaneous with the socialist ones. <laughs> Like, you have a bourgeois revolution, and then six months later, 
but what's the point of a bourgeois revolution then if that's not what you're developing, right? And that's, you know, when Bordiga was like making digs at the Soviets and the, and the Chinese revolutions, this was part of what he was getting at, you know, and I don't completely agree with them, but like I said, part of this was got, is true. They, they had to do all bourgeois development and they had to do it very fast. And in and, and many ways, I mean, if you look at the Soviet economy, and there are contradictions in this, you know, and I've gone into it before with Doug, but you do have to almost admire how fast they did it. You know, if you look at China, China's transition now, you know, and it is it, it is piggybacking on capitalist development. They, and I don't I don't say that insultingly. It's just true. They have pushed what took us 300 years and 30 and Russia. Russia pushed what took 200 years and 30. Even a, a country that I consider somewhat basket casey, like the Democratic People's Republic of, of Korea, they did they did uh, industrial development better than the South did. And they did it faster. And if you were going to predict which economy was going to be stronger in 1971, you probably would have said the North. I met a guy in Uganda, and he told me that in 1961, South Korea's economy was the same size as Uganda's economy. Yeah, in the mid-60s, Ethiopia was sending South Korea food. <laughs> yeah. And you know what he said to me as well? He said one of the main exports from South Korea in 1961 was Korean women's hair for wigs. Yeah, I mean, and I, I only know, I mean, I know that from living there and talking to the older generation there, but it's amazing to me. Even even the countries we, we kind of see as basket casey, I don't want to completely write them out because they did things that even liberals who are anti-communist will tell you is kind of like, I, I hear liberal, liberal podcasts ask the question all the time, like, what do you make of Stalin? Like, really? Because it's hard to imagine that the czar could have done what Stalin did as far as Russian development. I think it's an easier task to push a non-capitalist economy to a, a capitalist economy than it is to develop a capitalist economy. So, for example, it's easier for North Korea to get to a certain stage of capitalist development than a, than a capitalist economy is. Oh, yeah. But it's much harder for them to move their development onwards because you solve the simple problem and then it becomes a much different thing. It's not just building roads and houses and schools. What type of consumption will we have? You know, it's a different problem that doesn't lend itself to the type of planning that they use. Yeah. Once you get past industrialization, the, the planning models get harder. I mean, the, the, I, I think that's an objective fact. And it's, it's another one where, you know, I, I frankly, I've talked to a lot of people who've been radicalized recently in the in the communism. They always talk about planning. I'm not against planning. My, my big thing about planning is I point out that capitalists do it even at a state level. Like, let's be honest here. Absolutely. The, the most successful capitalist economies are the most planned. Right. So I don't. I'm not. I'm not shitting on planning. But let's also not like overpromise what it can do. One of the things about about capitalist economies and the most successful ones that are highly planned, there are areas in which they plan and there are areas in which they don't. Like they're not trying to mandate consumption rationing. One of the things that people have been surprised at me about is I'm a stagist, right? I actually do think like there there are going to be stages out of communism. I mean, out of communism, haha. There'll be stages out of communism too, probably. But stages, stages into communism. I think you made that exact same faux pas in your Doug Lane episode. Yeah. <laughs> the exact same one. <laughs> oh, but I actually am beginning to think that like something like market socialism may be unavoidable. And um, even if you had a violent revolution, because for one thing, I don't think markets are actually the only thing, are even the primary thing that defines capitalism. I think it's abstract value, and which you have to have markets for. But there are, a bit, as I argue with capitalists, capitalism's eternal because they'll find all these markets, you know. It's okay if it's eternal, if it's not dominant, you see. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, well, you know, it's like with feudalism. Like, there was probably profit-making enterprises through the heart of feudalism on very small scales, but feudalism was the dominant one. And it was the king and the queen and the lords and the lands. Exactly. So, like, if there are markets on the edge after a revolution, who gives a fuck once it's not dominant? That's the main thing. My, my other thing, though, that I worry about, and this is where I sound like an anarchist, um, is I do worry about the bureaucratic class in any socialist revolution because it's been such a problem at problem. <laughs> because everyone's like, well, I, could, I mean, I was literally arguing with someone the other day. They're like, well, the, the, the central planners will just not have any politics because there'll be no profit for them to have it. I'm like, but there'll still be power relations. Like, they don't go away. It's just status. <laughs> right. You know, it would be, which, where do you sit at the theater relations? Yeah, I mean, like, 
let's not pretend that, that that isn't a form of class that we have to mitigate against. And and maybe maybe I'm sounding like a fucking Trotskyist or something. But you have to do you almost have like a permanent revolutionary mindset about that. God, I do sound like a Trotskyist. That's terrible. In another way, I think that there's a truth to that. That you that is that is something you're always going to have to battle within socialism too is the emergence of new classes, which means that antagonistic politics isn't going to go away immediately. And I don't know how we got here from Vietnam, except to the question that Vietnam in some ways, I mean, like, man, I watched that last couple episodes. It was funny because I, I heard a lot of Marxists compl- and liberals complaining about how this was like, um, that it was almost propaganda. And I'm like, I don't know. I think, I think of anything I've ever seen, even the anti-war movies, I think the Viet Cong come out looking pretty good. <laughs> and it's Ken Burns documentary. Like you at least respect them. Like, you know, they were more badass than you. Some of the Americans that were in there that were interviewed, some of them were lefties, but some of them weren't. One of them was like the high commander of the US Air Force for ten years or something. You know, and you could see them, they were just like blown away by, by the South and North Vietnamese. You know, really blown away by them. It it's hard not to it's hard not to respect them even if you think like, oh my you know, you do wonder, you know, I, I wonder about this too. The other question I've always had, and I'm going to frame it in a pop cultural reference that your British listeners may not get, but there, there's this villain in the, in the movie Serenity, who ironically, I completely sympathize with the villain in that movie, but who said, you know, in creating a society, a lot of what you're going to have to do to create a peaceful society is going to be so messed up that you can't participate in that society. And I do wonder about that too. Because, for example, like, I have come to believe that Stalin was pretty sincere in a lot of stuff he said. And uh, his conspiratorialness, and as bloody as that got, that came out of, you know, his own history in Georgia and what they had to do to survive and the kind of conspiracies that, that, you know, really did exist that the Tsar was doing and other things. And that even they were doing. And how that warps you. You know, and and the the leaders of of Vietnam who were really successful were not the leaders of the of the Viet Cong, as far as like, like transitioning the economy and running a kind of market socialist economy and balancing out state powers and all that. Those are the people who were, you know, the third generation out. I always wonder about that, because our natural inclination is to put the leaders of the revolution, who are military leaders effectively, you know, as the leaders of the country, but that may not be actually all that smart. Look at. Say Ireland, most of the most respected, say IRA fighters and leaders of the IRA, most of them actually, I don't think, became politicians. Because I think you know, they're na- maybe they're yeah. too radical for the politics. You know, the type of guys they're probably just too too intense or something. Right. I mean, like it just, it just you think about what it require what what it requires you to be able to do, and you know, shooting a shooting a village worth of informants, which uh, again, like I, I always joke, but. Well, I don't joke. I actually make this point to people talk about revolution cavalierly. I'm like, you know, there's a woman, for example, who turned over anti father police. And I'm like, if you if this was an actual revolutionary moment, you'd have to kill her. It doesn't matter if you think she's, you know, just misguided or stupid and she's not evil. You'd have to kill her because if you didn't in a true military conflict, you just cost 100 lives. There's a there's a brutal utilitarian calculus you have to take that I want in a military leader that I do not want in a, in a fucking war, you know in a leader uh, you know of someone transitioning us to a classless society you know what I mean like yeah you, you end up stuck sometimes you end up stuck with the the guys who are great at getting you to a certain position and then they're the biggest assholes in the world and you're stuck with them right I mean like I, I talk a lot of shit about Mao. But he was a brilliant tactician in general. There's, there's no way around that. The man was, for, for a person who came out of, like, declassified like peasant backgrounds, who was, a, who was, you know, basically a kind of a, a, a roustabout college student for the first part of his life, he was a brilliant tactician, as was Zhou Enlai. And Zhou Enlai had the intelligence, for example, to eventually back Mao, even though they were fundamentally opposed in a lot of ways. And he was, much, he was a much better political mind than Mao was even though he was kind of a Mandarin. I mean, he was sort of a class traitor to, to his class. But Zhou Enlai, even he had to do things that like that most Westerners would be shocked at. I mean, like, and he, he's one of the cleaner people out of the, the Chinese Revolution. Um, but, you know, but one of the things he had to do, for example, there was a traitor in his midst who betrayed him to the Commandant. And this is one of the black, the only black spots I could find on Zhou Enlai. But Zhou, like, didn't just have him killed. He had his family killed and, like, his servants killed. And, like, you know, it was pretty, like, mafia, take out your line sort of thing. And that's what they had to do. 
it's, it's interesting because when you look at like the bourgeois revolutions, you don't see as much of that. <laughs> they did it too. I know they did it, uh, but you one. don't see it in the same way. Not just the revolutions, even just their ruling. Like, look at all the brutal slaughters in Ireland, that, you know, every every 10 years or something. Well, I'm also, you know, they did it. I'm, I'm also thinking about the difference in, in some ways, the difference in the United States and Britain is that, like, the people who the bourgeois powers turned on were more clearly external. And you had the racial politics. If you, if you factor that in, yes, they were absolutely just as brutal. Even there, um, what's interesting to me is how they didn't agree on that. If you look at the more conservative members of the uh, the American Revolution, they were also the most likely ones. The, the, the most conservative, the most radical were far, were far more likely than the quote-unquote middle to oppose slavery. So you had John Adams on one end and Tom Paine on the other. They were both abolitionists way, way early, whereas everybody else was all mealy-mouthed about it or outright in support of it, John Locke style. And yes, if you look at, the, if you look at oh my God, the Jacobins and all the shit that went down with that, but... It's also funny to me because I think people forget the Jacobins were essentially bourgeois revolutionaries. It's one of the things like you have you forget that right to property is a fundamental right and the and the and the rights of man and citizen. Like they weren't they weren't like proto socialist. Sorry, Jack. And there were proto socialists among them in the Inrajes and stuff, but they had been killed. So I, I guess we we come away from this question about Vietnam having answered all kinds of historical questions with a. Shit's way more complicated than than we like, <laughs> than or at least than I like. I mean, because I, I do I do run away from this going like, where is the where is the truly proletarian revolution? And the closest thing you have to it is Russia. Yeah, I, I'll give Spain too, but Spain lost. I get like, and Germany was proletarian, but they lost. The German revolution was by a small number of people, where the Spanish one was, was a mass, by the mass. Right. Yeah. The Spanish one was a mass in all areas of Spain too. It wasn't just in Moscow or Petersburg or wherever the in Russia, and then emanated out. Right. The, well, that's also fair. It was. It, it and, and and also in many ways the peasants and the and the proletarian were much more aligned in some ways. Uh, although in Spain they were in Spain, like the peasant class were lo- high anarchism in the in some of the most rural areas. And actually, the, I'm thinking of the uh, of the same thing in the Mexican Revolution. This is very similar. That was also a pretty highly proletarian revolution, in so much that there was a lot of proletarian in Mexico. But what what makes it complicated is what, when religion starts getting into it, because there was a lot of anti clerical sentiment initially. But when the Falange was able to get some some proletarian support, it was over religion. You know, religion, and then the weirdness of the national syndicalists being on both sides, kind of. On this episode, you heard the theme tune The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters by Sun Ra and his orchestra, and you are now listening to Colin Carr playing box cello suite number no. three in C major. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. <laughs> <laughs>